you're wearing a sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. Give me a full ballerina skirt and a hint of saloon and I'm on board. Mm. I can't go back. Welcome to the She Became Visible podcast. I'm your host, Renee Steelman. This podcast is my story. It's your story. It's our story. It's all the stories of all the women who one day knew that it was time to remember who they were, who they are, and stand up and be seen. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me today on She Became Visible. I am so excited to introduce my guest to you today. I have as a guest, and I'm a little bit, I'm kind of doing a little bit of a fangirl thing. I have Dr. Jennifer Bird on my show today. Can you believe it? I was introduced to Jennifer um, through Dan McClellan. And when I saw a woman, biblical scholar, I almost jumped out of my skin. I was like, yes, I knew there had to be someone out there that was female. Now, you know, I've had Reverend Carla on. I've had Allie Henry, who is also a minister on. And so, but Jennifer is specifically a Bible scholar. And today what we're going to talk about are the, is the women in the Bible, specifically all of the stories that we've been told that if most of you are like me, and especially in my generation where we listen to these stories and we just kind of went, uh-huh, okay. Oh, that, oh, yeah, that sounds right. Uh, Hagar, sure. Okay, well, yeah, she's barren. So yeah, give her the concubine. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we didn't even think of it in present day uh, context. And I know now, and, and I'm not saying, and Jennifer will, will highlight, we're not talking about presentism. We're not talking about putting today's standards on past centuries, but we're going to be talking about the truths that, that are in the Bible that we kind of skip over a little bit. So let me start out and introduce you to Jennifer. So, um, we're going to be taking most of our conversation from a book that she uh, uh, read, and we'll talk a little bit, or that she wrote, um, which is amazing because she narrates the book herself. I really suggest getting the audio version like me. I get the audio version and I get the um, Kindle version so that I can read along or go back and copy and paste. And um, But she reads the actual scripture. So she's not just you know, saying things. She's reading the actual scriptures from the Bible and then interpreting them. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, this is my uh, Jennifer Bird, just absolutely so beautiful. And she, this is one of the other books that she's uh, uh, written. And I'm going to ask Jennifer if this is her new one, Marriage in the Bible, What Do Texts Say? And I'm excited to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. And um, and permission granted is the book that we're going to be highlighting today. Now, let me make this uh, see if I can make this a little bit bigger there. OK, so Jennifer Bird, Ph.D., an East Coaster by upbringing undergrad and graduate schools. Dr. Bird has taught in New Jersey, Texas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Oregon and Virginia. She is currently embracing the title Public Biblical Scholar. And I love that. And you can follow her commentary and interview videos and her official co-hosted podcast at the links at the top of this site. Now, this is her website, so you, you will direct you to that. Her background within the United Methodist Church, education in a Presbyterian-affiliated institution, more than a decade spent in several ministerial contexts, six years of graduate work in biblical studies, and more than 25 years of teaching in classrooms of all kinds, 
And uh, let's see, I can't read that word. Uh, I inform her approach to having quite honest and sometimes difficult conversations about what is actually to be found in the scriptures of the Christian Bible. No question, her favorite conversations include gender, sexuality, and marriage, what the Bible does and does not say about them. And that is what we are going to be talking about today. So I highly recommend quickly getting this book after uh, we're done talking about what we're going to be talking about today. So let me bring on Dr. Bird. Ta-da! <laughs> Hello, Renee. What a lovely welcome and introduction. Thank you. Well, it's all true. And I am just absolutely so impressed hmm. with your experience. And I love the fact that you have kind of made this topic your central focus mm -hmm. for your studies and what you talk mm -hmm. about on your podcast, because it's mm -hmm. so important. And let me give you a little indication of why I find this so important. And I and hang on, everyone. If Jennifer, if you're not familiar with this, um, <clears throat> I think this particular talk was given in 2017. I could be wrong. Okay. But um, Dallin Oaks is the first counselor in the presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Okay. So there is an apostle, and the apostle has two counselors, and then there are twelve. Um, 12 apostles. So there's okay. the prophet, two counselors, and then 12 apostles. Okay. He right now is the first counselor <clears throat> in the presidency. Uh, the first presidency, I think someone said their combined ages were, was, uh, let's see, the prophet is 99, <clears throat> Dallin Oaks is 91, <clears throat> and the second counselor is 92. Okay. <laughs> so that's what we're working with here, just to let you know. <laughs> And this particular man is, <clears throat> and he has quite a prestigious um, uh, resume for okay. what he's done as far as his law, you know, teaching in Chicago and okay. uh, Supreme Court in Utah and, and other things. Okay. But he was very instrumental in writing a proclamation to the world, the family. That's wow. what it was officially called. Right. And this was all put into place when all of the laws were going in about same-sex marriage. And they tried to post a um, amicus brief mm. and they were told, oh, no, no, you cannot file an amicus brief because you have to prove <clears throat> that this doctrine that you have has always been there, that this isn't something new that you've just created to enable yourself to file an amicus brief. Interesting. So they came up with this proclamation to the world and um, supposedly, this is something that's just been, we've always known this. This has always been part of our doctrine. And so I'm just going to play <laughs> you a little clip okay. to kind of introduce us to the biblical marriage truth. That okay. Yeah. The proclamation begins by declaring that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the creator's plan for the eternal destiny of his children. It also affirms that gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. It further declares that God has commanded that the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between man and woman, lawfully wedded as husband and wife. Now, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you. <laughs> I don't know where it's at in the Bible. Maybe you can take <laughs> that out for us. <laughs> that old pre-mortal, mortal and eternal thing is is new to me. I'll just say that. But everything else, yep, yep, I've heard it all. And we can talk about any part of it that you want to. <laughs> and all of this Christian nationalism that's out there right now, same thing that, you know, God ordained marriage between a man and a woman who are to be wed just like in the Bible. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, th and that, you know, procreative sex is only, but, you know. I mean, procreative sex can only happen between a man and a woman. There's that. But yes, that he's trying to say that there's no sex before marriage and 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 that sex is reserved for marriage and can only be that which could potentially lead to children, which is one of the big hangups that yeah, right. people have. Yeah. And no, I, no, no, no. All, all of that. It's just crazy. Legally and lawfully right? read. Yeah. That was one of my favorite things because tell everyone, like, I, I want to read a little bit from your book. 
<laughs> biblical marriage. If someone says that she supports only biblical marriage, what kind of a marriage do you think she's referring to? I usually take it as a reference to marriage between one man and one woman, perhaps with some disdain for divorce. <laughs> biblical marriage, however, is a far cry from marriages based on mutual love and respect as we expect today. And the Christ-centered marriage was not even Jesus's idea. Yes, <laughs> so talk about the idea as you further go in on in your book, you talk about how a man and a woman came together and what the female, where her stand was mm -hmm. in the community. So talk mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And if you don't mind, I, I am just going to do a quick plug to clarify something for you oh. and, and your listeners. Yes. Yeah. No, you're looking at chapter four of Permission Granted, right, is what you're yeah. looking at. Right. And that chapter is called Sex, Who, What, and Why? Because when you're talking about marriage in the Bible, really all you're doing is talking about sex. The, the language around marriage focuses on, centers around the sex act. Okay. And so you, and so we can tease that out a little bit, Renee, in terms of, you know, how that plays out. But the other thing is that chapter on sex in, in the Bible is essentially so important to me that I did and for several reasons, I ended up writing a book that basically takes that content and teases it out farther. So yes, my most recent book is called, Mar and you did reference that in the intro, Marriage in the Bible, What Do the Texts Say? And I am actually currently working on the audio for that as well. Excellent. And so that is, um, it's, I think you would love this also, Renee, just because that's the chapter from Persian Grader yeah. that you wanted to focus in on. So yeah, so we can talk about, let's, you know, I'm trying to figure out which, how to start this conversation in terms of what's going on biblically, but you wanted to say something. Well, in, in chapter seven, you talked about how women were basically property. That's right. That's and right. so when you say they were wed uh -huh. or they were legally and lawfully married, oh, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Women in the, in biblical contexts, women are property. That's, you know, um, cover to cover, they are talked about in this kind of a way. So you referenced briefly in our kind of chat before we went live, Renee, the, um, the story of Hagar and, you know, Sarah is deemed, um, is believed to be barren. And so they need a child. And so how are they going to do that? Well, they use, of course, they use the enslaved person who lives in their house because enslaved peoples have always been available to their owners for sex. That's it's just a given over the over the centuries. And people want to call Hagar a maid servant or something. No, she's a slave. She was an enslaved person. And so she is forced to be a surrogate um, in this situation. Women are property, right? The a couple chapters before the Hagar story in chapter 12 of Genesis, the very, very first story we get about this patriarch Abraham, still being called Abram at that point, but the very first story that we get is these promises from God to give him a piece of land and that his descendants will be numerous. And then the next thing hap that happens is Abraham pimps out Sarah to the Pharaoh of Egypt in order to save his own life and to get yeah. a whole bunch of loot. Like that's okay. the first thing we see about Sarah, right? Okay, so talk about that before we get into the, the property thing, because um, I thought that was fascinating as it's well. Is we read that, like I said, there are so many, when you, when you are taught as a yep. child, biblical yep. stories, yes. you hear these things and you're just like, Oh, Abraham. Oh, what a brave man you were. Exactly. And, and exactly. we, don't hear, we don't even hear it. I yeah. mean, it's, it's yeah. like someone flips a light switch right. and you go, wait, you did what with her? I mean, yeah. and I put everything now I compare everything in, in, in my former religion and even what's going on politically, I compare everything to my husband. Mm -hmm. And I'm always saying to him, if you did that to me, or you would never do that. Or, right, right. you know, when they'll say, well, they're just men, they're fallible. They make mistakes. I'm like, well, my husband has never set up 13 shell companies to try to, <laughs> you know, I mean, he might be a little annoying at times, and, you know, when you talk about fallibility, That's but awesome. he's not, you know, we're not going into South Dakota and he's like, okay, now pretend you're my sister. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> I think, you know, this book. Oh, go tell, tell that story. I love that. No, I just, I've been um, pulling clips because I did story time on chapter 12 of Genesis last summer. And yeah. So yeah, pretend you're my sister. I, I know that you're beautiful, right? And they're going to want you and they're going to kill me to, so they can have you. So tell them you're my sister right? And then everything will go well for me because of you. And that's exactly what happens. They get into Egypt and they see this beautiful woman and, uh, you know, Abraham hands her over because she is his property, right? The exchange, women and women's bodies have been the exchange thing between men for millennia, right? She, so he hands her over. She goes into the Pharaoh's concubinage and, um, and the story says, I should maybe pull it, go find my Bible and pull it up. But the story says that Pharaoh d- dealt kindly with Abraham be- on account of her, right? So what, was she was she good in bed, <laughs> right? Was she clever? Was she creative? I don't know. But because of her, Pharaoh gave a very nice bride price, very nice gift of bride price to Abra- Abraham um, in exchange for Sarah, right? And so then, then there's a plague sent on Pharaoh because of Sarah, and it's not really clear why, because the Pharaoh wasn't doing anything wrong, right? Pharaoh was actually blessing them by treating them so well. And yes, Renee, I have students all the time who say, oh, well, it's because Abraham wasn't being faithful. He was like trusting God and he didn't have great faith. And everybody's like worried about Abraham and nobody pays attention to what's going on with Sarah. Right. I'm with you. It took I had to it was graduate school before I paid attention to what happened to Sarah there. Right. And now I can't stop talking about it. Right. Um, I actually have students in my intro to the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible course there this is the second week of class and they are i'm asking them to read that chapter several times and then i want you to write a letter from sarah to abraham in light of what goes down in egypt and in light of these promises god gave to abraham that he would give him a piece of land that people were already living in oh interesting interesting isn't it yeah like that's from the start exactly. from the very beginning of the story it was clear that someone already lived there and and so and I get some of the coolest letters. Like I get some people, male, male, female, and otherwise, who have these really interesting insights into that. And just some of them will just say, this is my, I'm, I'm leaving you. I know I can't divorce you, but I'm leaving you. <laughs> and some of them, those who are Christian have a really hard time challenging the narrative and saying that there's something wrong here, right? They have a, they kind of find ways to make it nice. Like, I know that your life was threatened and you love me. And so I'm going to forgive you or whatever. And we need to work together. And I'd rather you ask me about it next time. You know, like they'll do all kinds of what you were saying, Renee, right? Just finding ways to make it okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then get these letters from people who didn't grow up with this and didn't grow up needing the Bible to be good and holy. And they're like, what the (laughs) <laughs> what is going on ironic is i you i don't know how much you were following the tim ballard thing but all the sex trafficking and how he was you know he was fighting for for sex trafficking and what and, and he was he was uh oh jennifer you are gonna have to take the semester off to catch up on the tim ballard story <laughs> and got this mormon kid who um who was working supposedly for homeland security in um down in uh new mexico i think anyway he decided he saw what he thought was sex trafficking going over the border and he decided to start a nonprofit organization called underground railroad o o u r operation underground railroad and he was going to get sex trafficking trafficking off the face of the earth and he prayed and he used his membership as in the Mormon church, you know, because that affiliated him with all kinds of important people. He got a, he got kind of a special relationship with one of the apostles who basically, you know, put him into the limelight and come to find out he was actually flying to Haiti and doing all of these other things, going to all these places and partaking in sex and abusing women. And I mean, it's a whole What? Thing. He's been excommunicated from the church, but I just saw a recent YouTube where he's thinking of joining the Catholic church. And I thought, yeah, because, you know, if you want to go against sex trafficking, that's the organization. (laughs) (laughs) 
but I mean, so it, it was like, it was like, okay, you're going to go to evangelicals, Catholic, to support you in your sex trafficking. Have you read the Bible? <laughs> if, you know, if you are going to go along with an inerrant, biblical, literal, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. context, have you read the Bible? Right. And then let's talk about sex trafficking. Right. So, right. And that's yeah. what you're, and I can't read the new book, yeah. but go on. Yeah, so, no, it's yeah. exactly the yeah. women. I mean, women are pimped out. Yeah. Yeah. Women are our property. Right. Yeah. And when you look at the way marriage is talked about in both. Well, let's talk about the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament first, because okay. one of the things that's really fascinating when people say legally and lawfully married yes. is the language in the Hebrew Bible is not at all saying what our translations lead us to believe that they are saying. So there are two really big issues, points here that that were, for me, when I first realized it, were just like groundbreaking, significant mind shift thing going on here. And so the first one is, there isn't a verb that means to marry in the Hebrew Bible. <clears throat> so if you have a translation that talks, that uses the word marry, you know, kind of some form of the verb to marry in any of your English translation that you're reading in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, that should probably be replaced with to take, not to marry. So, um, and and in the my second in my most recent book, I have all kinds of charts to kind of show you all what I mean. So you know, like the English translation says this, and the Hebrew says to take. And every single time, it's to take, to take, to take, to take. And well, that doesn't sound bad, Doctor Burr, because in wedding ceremonies today, we ask, "Do you take this person?" And do you take this person? You know, to be your spouse. You know, yeah. and that's not what it's saying. It's it's to take, as in actually the story we just referenced. The Pharaoh, when he realizes that Sarah is actually belongs to Abraham, he's like, take your woman and go. And that's the same verb that's used when it, to in, when a man marries a woman. He takes a woman. He purchases her from her family, from her father. And so she goes from belonging to her father to belonging to this man. And if you went through and replaced every single time you saw Mary in the Hebrew Bible and just replace it with take, right? He takes her. He takes her and just let that kind of flow over you a little bit to like, how does that change the way you think about it? Yeah. And then the second is actually just as important in my opinion. And that is there isn't. So, you, you know, when we talk about people who are single or, you know, who, who are not married, we have a way to designate that they are single, right? Bachelor, bachelorette, single, whatever. And then we have a different way to refer to people once they are married, right? So we have language to designate pre and post, right? Senior, senorita, miss, missus. All the, right? All the different ways. And it, it, yes, and in different languages that we do that in the Hebrew and in the Greek. So in the Newer Testament as well, we should not have any, I think, it would be a better reflection of the Hebrew and the Greek if we never saw husband or wife. Mm. It's just my man, my woman. She is your woman. And, and even in the Newer Testament, so that the, the nouns in the Greek and the nouns in the Hebrew do the same thing. We have a noun, you, you refer to, you know, Sarah or whoever as a woman, and then they are taken and then they are still a woman. Whereas we have a, des a designation between, you know, a single woman and a married woman or, right, a, a woman and now, and she is a wife. We have that language. Right. The Hebrew and Greek didn't. And so I have a couple different translations, like a couple really powerful passages where I take the, you know, I put the English, typical English translation next to my translation, which removes the verbs to marry and it removes husband and wife language. And it's really powerful. And when you look at something like First Corinthians 7 or Ephesians 5, where, that talks about, you know, husband, what in English, what are husbands and wives and how they're to relate to each other. And it's really men and women, even if it is being written to people in a coupled up, like a married partnership, you know, married relationship, what, what we call married today. The Greek didn't distinguish that yet. So they are talking about what we call marriage in a much more raw kind of a thing, kind of a way. Does, does this make sense? What I'm yeah, getting at? absolutely. And I, and I love that you, 
you talked about that when you started talking about like polygamy. And I, I've often heard people in the evangelical world, they'll actually say married when Abram married Hagar. Exactly. You know, they do. They, in their minds, they have they have to nope. be legally and lawfully married for yes. the of God. I'm looking for hang on a second. Okay. It's in the in the passage in verse in chapter 16, it says Sarah hands her over to him as a wife. That is how it is translated. But in the Hebrew, she hands him over. And so the Hebrew just says as a woman. So here's the thing, Renee. Biblically speaking, to say she handed her over her enslaved person to her to her man to be a wife, that just means she handed her over for sex. Right. When you to say as a wife, we're talking about I get to have sex like he now gets to have sex with her. So there's this weird it's it's both um, a, there's a double standard. And it is also this weird thing about you have this this woman's body. I get to have access to it for sex. Mm -hmm. And what's but it's the double standard is there because, well, men get to decide. <laughs> If you're yeah. a concubine or if you're a wife and, you know, in, in terms of a status there and oh, okay. concubines are women who are purchased purely for sex and they don't get the, the official wife status. Oh, okay. So for instance, sleep in the bigger bedroom or right. is that, what, what is the advantage of the difference between the <laughs> concubine or That's the wife? Awesome. Oh. Um, I think, well, the main thing would be the, uh, the amount of support they would have, like um, in terms of food oh, yeah. and clothing, oh. the amount of resources that the man would be expected to provide. Um, yeah. So, so for instance, when you talk about biblical marriage, right, let's, let's look at everybody's favorite Jacob, right? Um, yeah. Right. So he works for seven years and then he turns to the dude, he turns to his future father-in-law in our terms and says, okay, I've worked long enough. Let me have her. <laughs> yeah. I want to go into her. He uses this yeah. very literal language, right? And as many people know, Laban gives him the wrong daughter, right? He gives her, gives him his first daughter. And all that happens is everybody gets together for a big dinner to celebrate. And then Jacob goes in and has sex with the woman that he is acquiring, right? Now, does she still have her veil on? Is that why you can tell? I, <laughs> I mean, I, I know. That was clear or not. Right. Or, it was dark. I mean. Daughter. Just kind of feeling around. It's like this will work. I don't know if this, this will work. Okay, go on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. That's it. There's no wedding ceremony. It's just, I'm giving you my daughter. You're, you know, you have worked for her. You have paid for her, and now you get to have sex with her and claim her as your own. And so, in this case, having sex is what denotes marriage. Oh, that's true. But it is only when that is what the man wants, because then he's like, he wakes up in the morning and like, wait a minute, you gave me the wrong daughter. All right. And her, his father-in-law now says, okay, give her a week with you and then we'll let you have the other one too. And so within the week, he has two women who are his wives in our terms. And he has access to the enslaved women who came with them. Oh. So there are four women in his household that he gets to have sex with, no questions asked. But only two of them are wife status. I'm trying to do this so you can see it on the yeah. And the other two are enslaved peoples who don't count as much as humans, right? And so, but nobody's batting an eye because that's just what they did. Right, right. And that's how they get the 12 sons, or 13 really, right, yeah. that make up the tribes of Israel. So this is biblical marriage. Yeah. Not all four women are thought of as wives. That's biblical. Yeah. Right. So, so that, actually, like you said in your book, you said um, this this reality alone ought to make us pause and think before passing along an idea simply because it comes from the Bible. To that point, yeah, polygamy was practiced by several of the patriarchs in yeah. the Bible, and then in parentheses you have. Joseph Smith drew on scripture to justify the practice totally. as a part of Mormonism. Yes. And then, like you say, because he did not differentiate between concubines and wives, 
he said, oh, no, no, they were all his wives and he could have as many wives as he wanted. And then he gave all these weirdo stipulations that he didn't follow. But yeah. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, Solomon, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Like it's a it's a ridiculous what what the distinction is there is more about politics yes. and the family or the the group of people that this that each woman came from and whatever status she had or that the connection the political alliance that she represented for him so whether she was you know right so is he acquiring a woman for political alliance or is he simply acquiring her for sex well and exactly what you're saying it's considered property so right. it's no different exactly. than I have this many sheep, I have this many cows, right. exactly. I have this many cars in my garage, Jay right. Leno. And and so it's like, you know, classic cars and classic concubines, same. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> Therefore, I am rich. I am yeah. really rich and important. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what it boiled down to. It does. And, you know, the 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 concept of what makes people married in the Hebrew Bible and as far as we can tell in the newer Testament is that they have sex. Right. Well, this even is, the Jewish practice today, right. It's like yeah. everybody gets married then they stand outside the, the door while everything's consummated. And yeah. they're like, okay, now you're married, you know, yeah. Yeah. unfortunately we don't do that in the Christian world kind of, but yeah. But so, yeah. That mm-hmm. is, that is what it's all about. You it know? is. Yeah. And so, so for, on a certain level, you know, I like to point out to people that, for for people today who get really hung up on the sex that a couple is going to have and whether or not it can be procreative, they come by that hang up honestly, because it is what their scriptures have taught them to think about and to focus on. That is right. all anybody cares about in the Bible, even in the Newer Testament. I mean, when you, I don't think you read it, here but you did beforehand the what you know god oh, thank you jesus you know thank you god for what jesus told oh, us yeah, taught was, us about covenant I was, I was saying that um it, this last weekend in the the mormon church they had what they call general conference and one of the ladies who gave a closing prayer in her prayer said dear heavenly father we're so grateful for jesus and the things that he taught us about the marriage covenant yeah yeah which can we talk about what jesus actually taught people about the marriage covenant i don't i don't don't, i'm gonna ask jennifer about that (laughs) yeah okay what does he actually say he says you can leave your family to follow me that's not good family values idea right okay we have another passage where he's attributed with saying well, people of this world marry and are given in marriage but in heaven it's not so and in fact being married can actually be a hindrance to you in the afterlife. And then there's another passage <laughs> where, where some Pharisees approach him because they don't believe in the afterlife and, and, or the resurrection. And he, and they, they pose that levered marriage scenario, right? Where a woman is married to a man and then he dies before giving her children. And so she is forced to marry all six or seven brothers, right? Nobody ever stops to talk about what that might have been like for her, by the way, no. having to have sex with all seven brothers. Okay. Right. And then and so they pose this and they say, so whose woman is she in the in the resurrection? Because, again, in the Newer Testament, we still don't have husband, wife in the Greek. It's still just man and woman. So whose whose woman is she in the resurrection? And Jesus doesn't take that moment to say, maybe we should stop doing this levirate marriage thing. No, he seems okay with the Levert marriage scenario. And he just goes on to say, oh, it's, you just don't even understand the resurrection. You don't understand scripture. And blah, 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 blah. Like, so Jesus affirms Levert marriage practice. He affirms people leaving their families to follow him. He says it's probably better if you don't marry to begin with. And then the biggie is, for me at least, that, and I kind of got to dive deeper into that when I was researching for my newer book, uh, Marriage in the Bible. You know, the passage in Matthew 19 is similar to um, earlier in Matthew 5 and then in Luke and Mark. But this, you know, when he's questioned about which reason for divorce are you okay with, Jesus? And he responds by kind of there's a there's a banter about marriage and divorce that has been established for at least a couple hundred years within the Jewish tradition. And he plays along. He's like, well, you know, it says this in Genesis 127 and this in Genesis 224. But I say, you know, that if you 
uh, let me look at, let me turn to it really quickly. Cause I, every time I try to refer to it, I, I, I mess up the, the specific language and I want to read it because it's really helpful. He, is it lawful for a man to be divorced? Is it lawful to divorce his woman for any cause? And that's the question there is actually for any cause or only for certain causes. And there are two Jewish rabbis who are highly respected, who have two different opinions on that. So they're asking which one he wants. And he answered, have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? So that's from Genesis 127 and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman and the two shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 2.24. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay, people like to quote that as like, this is this is defining biblical marriage. Jesus, yeah. Jesus isn't saying anything new here. He's actually just playing out the debate as it goes. What Jesus contributes comes, comes later. And then we go on and it says, they said, well, then why did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? And he said, it's because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce, but from the beginning it was not so. But I say to you, so here comes some of the, the stuff that Jesus is introducing, which in Matthew he often does that. He takes a Jewish, he takes a Hebrew Bible law and he makes it more difficult to follow instead of relaxing the law in any way. I say to you, whoever divorces his woman except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. So here's one of the biggest things for me was in sitting with that. The, the reason that adultery is a problem is because a man has sex with someone else's woman. Adultery in the Bible is about the sex act, pure and simple. It is not about having broken a sacred vow it is not about cheating on your spouse and your commitment to your spouse. It's about the woman's body as territory. Period. And does it, okay. Does it make a difference <clears throat> that if um, if you if the man was to have sex with an unmarried woman, that's not adultery. That's but not it's adultery. So a married woman, you took someone else's property. Right. Yeah. And that's what adultery is. Yeah. And so when Jesus is saying. If you, if you divorce, we're assuming you're going to remarry, and so you'll have sex with someone else. And so that will be committing adultery against your first marriage, the first people, you know, this first bond that you made. And so what he is saying is that sex really is the only thing that matters. Right. It's not that, as we know, right, it's not that divorce can be really hard on everyone, right? right? Children, it's hard on you personally, even if it's something that you've both agreed to. It's still hard. It's a financial burden. It's a, right? It's a, you lose people, you lose right. things. It is painful. That's why divorce is hard. Right. But he's talking about, you can't do this because you're going to have sex with someone else. That's it. Yeah. So sex, biblically speaking, marriage is about sex. Sex is about marriage. So when people today do make it sound like you can't, you can't have sex outside of marriage, there's a part of me that agrees with that. Yeah. But the reason all of that is important for these ancient men is because the woman's body is territory. It is property. And Jesus affirms that idea, which is very unsettling. <laughs> It was, and I think that's so important. I remember even thinking this to myself when you look back, or even if you if you're one of the people that follows or watches the chosen, and you see that he's got these apostles that he's called and said, "Come follow me. Put your nets down and come follow me." He doesn't say, "And bring your kids and your wife along," or "What time do you have to be home?" Right? Or, Does your wife have dinner? And how many kids do you have? Or anything like that? He just says, "Drop everything and come follow me." And I remember thinking at the time, "Wait a minute, what happened to their family?" Yeah. And then you see this set up as a precedence. And now that is exactly what you see yeah. in, in people in fundamental religions. It's like, look, I have a career and I'm and that's what I'm going to focus on. And you guys, I don't know, don't bother me. I have other things <laughs> I have to do. And that's, that's the precedence. Your own. Yeah. And even in the, in the polygamy, you had the wives that were literally there to create babies. The, the idea was to create little baby Mormons so That's they right. could grow this territory. Right. And so it had nothing to do with love. It had nothing to do with even caring for them, actually. So talk about how, like, when Sarah 
was barren. Therefore, she had no value. Wow. Right? She had no worth. And so she gave Hagar. And then talk about how, like you say, Hagar wasn't part of this. No one came to her and said, do you love him? Do you think (laughs) No, what do you think? Is there something you want to do too? I yeah. mean, that wasn't part of it. And probably being a woman of with a maternal instinct, perhaps she was like, I'd, I'd like a baby, or this will get me higher in the, you know, in the in the hierarchy if I have a baby and I'll be w- better taken care of. Is that was there a thought there? I, here's the thing, Renee. I just I, I don't know, I, I won't say the word R A P E, but yeah. that's that's how I look at that story. There's yeah. They, she had no consent whatsoever. Right. Did she decide to get on board with it? Maybe as a way for her own sanity's sake. But yeah. I don't think it makes any, personally, I don't think it makes any sense to even wonder if, yeah. how, I mean, she belonged, like she was purchased right. to belong to these other humans. Yeah, she She wasn't given any consideration in it. And you know, I, I, you know, people, people will say that to me that like, well, but they, she wanted to be a part of this covenant or she wanted to be a part of creating these, this nation or whatever. Maybe that, maybe she did. Maybe someone like that would have found that as a way to comfort herself in the midst of what she's being forced to do. But also I think it's important to keep in mind that even that story is being told from a male perspective. It's being yeah. told by men Right. who might have observed this kind of a dynamic because it would have played out a lot, right? right? I mean, so they've observed it and they're they're putting intentions and motivations and emotions onto these two women when they see something playing out between them. Doesn't mean that they have it they have it nailed down. Like it doesn't mean they they got it right, but it does mean that they're observe they've observed this behavior. They know how this plays out for women. Right. And on, on that same note, talk about, um, now I want to make sure I get my women right. Um, is it Ruth and Naomi or Esther and Naomi? Mm-hmm. Was Ruth. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I love when you talked about that, where it was like, because I remember I've only read the Old Testament once. Okay. And I remember I was determined I was going to start from the beginning. And I remember mm-hmm. after I got through, I was like, that was scary. And I don't want to <laughs> think about that anymore. <laughs> and the story of Ruth. And Naomi, I remember going, mm, I'm having a hard time with this. Mm. And it's a little bit like, you know, again, she's hot. She can seduce him. And then this is what we're going to get from this. And then when I go in in the in the Portland temple, there's a, a picture of her in the women's section of the mm. temple. I remember going, mm-hmm. I don't know how I feel about this <laughs> no story. So talk about what your interpretation is, because it's another okay. one of these um uh, you, you talk about that, then you talk about Bathsheba, and you talk, you know, the whole sexual woman that can seduce these men into doing things that they want them to do. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, and I won't keep it for four hours because we could go. We, could go, we could go for hours, couldn't we? We really could. And I do want to throw one thing out there so I don't forget to to say it. And that, and then I'll answer, I'll address that. But I do want to point out, and you you read it, I think, from, from the book. But um, I want to be really clear. When people say that marriage today is about two people choosing to marry voluntarily, um, it's based on love. They are equals. We don't, there isn't a single example of marriage like that in the Bible. And so, you know, people today are able to, to adjust, right? We want marriages that are loving and and mutually entered into. And I think that's a good thing to support, but it isn't biblical. So when people say something has to be in the Bible in order for it to be okay today, that's just not true. That is simply not true. And I think that's an important point to make. It really is, especially from the standpoint that, again, I'm old enough to remember and it didn't, you know, you don't even, I understand how when I take, I get married and I take my husband's name. Okay. And I always interpreted that to mean because when we have children, it makes it a lot easier to understand that those kids belong to me and him and those are our kids. And when I register from the school, they know who they belong to and it makes it a lot easier, right? That's how I interpreted it. I didn't even put the two and two together that I became his property. And just like everything else would have a, 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 you know, a stamp on it that said you belong to the S ranch. 
I now belong to the S branch, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that was like a, oh my gosh, type of a thing. But then to realize that I couldn't get a credit card, I couldn't open up a checking oh account, God, right? You know, in my lifetime, yeah. I could not do those things because I didn't have a job and I had to have my husband's signature. Now, yeah. what yeah. does that mean? I right. instilled his property. Exactly. He had to give permission. So this whole idea of biblical whatever is another word for patriarchy, ownership, and property rights. Yep. So it's kind of like we should stop throwing that word around. Yeah. People understand. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. You know, did he propose with a ring? My husband? Yeah. Uh, no. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> we, I, I, I called him and said, look, I, I was in the Navy at the time. And he was serving a mission for our church. And I said, when you get home from your mission, I have a 30 day leave. We can either date or we can get married and you can go back to Japan with me. And he's like, that sounds good. (laughs) So I I always say to him, I'm still waiting. And and we've been married for almost 50 years. So you got to up it to a couple of carrots. So I love it. Okay. It's a very, talk about that ring talk about the ring well but but i was gonna ask so you didn't he didn't have a ring did your father give you away did he walk you down the aisle uh well no because in the mormon church they don't do that oh but, gotcha okay but Continue. my kids i made i made sure that my kids had civil marriages or, <gasps> or civil ceremonies outside of the temple Ooh. because i thought that was not a marriage that was not the wedding i had dreamed of my whole life so in those cases yes cool. their father walked them you know, down the aisle. And so, yeah. which but, yes, is it's a demonstration yeah. of right. Handing the father There's owns that. the daughter, hands her over to the new man who owns but, her. Right. But in the LDS temple, mm-hmm. you kneel across an altar and you are given to your husband. So it's the same thing. You, you are, and you vow to obey your husband mm-hmm. as he obeys God. So yeah, <laughs> we were, we were not, you know, we didn't even have the Catholic version of being able to talk to Mary to get mm-hmm. to Jesus. You know, right. you're, you know, you go right to your husband. Right to your husband. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. So it, it was, even though you're not the physical father giving the property. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. vowed holding hands that you are being given to your mm-hmm. husband. Wow. He's that's, not given to you, but so he received right. you. Right. Because I receive you and I was given to you. So yeah. there you go. It's, it's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And well, again, don't think of it because it's just right. gotten, it's like blah, 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 custom blah, blah. and yep. It's what yeah. people do. And yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you asked yeah. me to talk about Ruth and Naomi and yeah. you, you already hit on some really important points, but I, so this, for people who aren't familiar with the story, it starts out and we get like this whole history in like eight verses, you know, so a couple from who are Jewish people, well, they're part of the Israelite people and there's a famine. And so they migrate to Moab, which is one of the most hated groups of people that are neighbors to them. And there's a story, an origin story that justifies that back in Genesis chapter 19, where two daughters both get, the, they get their hus- their father drunk two nights in a row or whatever and yeah. both get pregnant. Yeah. So yeah. that justifies a, this incestuous origin story, justifies their animosity towards Moabites. Anyway, so they move to Moab, they have two sons and they procure women for their two sons um, from among the Moabites. And then all the men, all the men die. And so we have a woman, a Jewish woman, Israelite woman, Jewish isn't yet a part of the language, an Israelite woman with two daughters-in-law from these hated group of people, the Moabites. And so by verse 16, in the first chapter, we get this moment where Naomi is the mother, the mother-in-law, and she looks at her two you know, daughters-in-law in our, in our terminology and says, look, I got, um, it's, things are better back home for me. You know, things have changed. So I'm going to go back and you two need to stay here with your families, return to your families and maybe they can, you know, sell you off again, return to your mother's house. That's what she says. Right. And Ruth clings to Naomi and says this really beautiful, you know, language about wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Um, Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. And there's a line in there also about your God will be my God, but it's one of multiple things that she promises. Well, what's interesting about that piece is that the clinging that she does there, that verb isn't very common in the Hebrew Bible. And 
it only happens a couple times. And it is used in Genesis 2, 24, when it says, therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and shall cling to his woman, and the two shall be one flesh. So this language of clinging, is this for survival? Is this clinging for life? You know, with life partners? I don't know. We know we could debate that. But it, there's a longing and a, a longing and a desire behind it as well. So n- mult, many, many hetero couples have had that, that passage, verse chapter one, verses 16 and 17, read at their wedding ceremonies, right? Yes. Yeah. Unironically, like it's it's legit that like this is a this is a lifetime commitment thing that you would say to a spouse. Um, so there's that, and it's a fascinating thing because it's Ruth, it's the younger woman, and her feeling toward this older woman. Whether or not it was reciprocated, I don't. It doesn't matter to me, and I actually don't think it is. But but everybody can tell how important Ruth is to Naomi, and this is and this plays out throughout the whole story, right? At the very end, when Na- when Ruth gives birth to someone, all the women in the town, you know, claim it as, as an Israelite child. And, you know, and this woman, Ruth is worth seven sons to you, Naomi, which is saying a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the point that you raised is also very disturbing to me and, and something that I have a hard time getting people, getting students to acknowledge, which is, yeah, Round about chapter two, Naomi sends Ruth off to the fields to work to support them. And and she is taken notice of. And the owner of the field that she works in, you know, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm, you know, follow my women and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that the men don't mess with you out there in the field, um, as men like to do. <laughs> and, yeah, Naomi sends her out. She's like, okay, it's time for threshing. So I'm going to go, go take a shower and put on your best dress and perfume. And uh, I'm, I'm sending you out to go work in the fields. Well, actually <laughs> this whole thing. <laughs> crashed a little bit. You know? <laughs> well, actually it's to go seduce Boaz, go seduce yeah. the man. Yeah. yeah. So I always think of that song. Um, fancy. Here's your last yeah. chance. Fancy. Yeah. Don't let me down. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. She sends yeah. her out. Go, go, you know, uncover his feet, go lay at his feet and then do whatever he tells you to do. And so she does and she's successful. And I mean, you nailed it, right? Like what is happening here, right? It's survival. It is survival. Yeah. But let's be honest about what's happening. And, you know, when she uncovers his feet, this is a euphemistic use of feet, right? And, and she tells him to cover her with his cloak, which is another euphemism for having sex with. And, you know, so it's just very, like all kinds of things are happening here that are not about family values, according to people today, right? Yeah. A woman pimps out her daughter-in-law for their survival. Okay. Right. 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 Good for them. They survived. Right. And then that woman disappears you know, the daughter disappears from the narrative once she produces a child for everybody else. Like she's gone. (laughs) It's, and it's, it's it's all the way through, like you say, it's all the way through the, when um, I, I don't, I, I don't have it here, but there's a, when every once in a while, when I was still a member of the church, people would say, what's your favorite scripture? Mm. And I would turn to, I believe it's Elma 52, where there's a handmaiden that one of the captains beats the crap out of. And so she's like, oh, you think that's going to happen? She escapes and goes and tell the, tells the other captain exactly what's happening. She, mm. you know, and that they, they're able to over overthrow the other army because she squealed because she got beat up. And I'm like, see, another woman saves the day. Mm. That, that was my <laughs> Whenever I, I would say that, they would go, where's that at? I'm like, it's <laughs> Just go back and read it. You know, nobody even, nobody talks about that, what the women have had to do or what they did to save you know, themselves. And, I, and so, yeah, I thought, everybody makes a big deal out of Ruth going with Naomi. And I'm like, you don't know what her story is. You don't know where her family is, or maybe she was beat up at home and maybe this was a better deal for her. And maybe it you was. Know, mm-hmm. it's not, nobody knows the whole story. That's it's right. Like, or who even writing the story, right. you know, there's yes. so much more to it that everybody, yes. goes, Oh, yeah, that sounds good. I love that. Amen. You know, right. Yeah. yeah. She's going to worship our God now. So that makes her good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's actually a scholar who, who uh, talks about Orpah 
um, the other daughter-in-law who chooses to stay with her own people and go back to her own family and her own culture and how she is a model for native women um, who, you know, in light of all the, you know, um, anyway, it's kind of a side, side comment, but it's, you know, you know, the native peoples were forced to convert. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and so holding up this woman who, who chose very much not to like, nope, I'm going to stay with my own people. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, one of the fascinating things about the Bible is um, I had, again, I had no idea where a lot of people's names came from. Mm. And so you were talking about Tamar and, you know, and Deborah and Joanna and Susanna. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? And, you know, and even the whole Jacob and Joshua and yeah. all of these names. I knew those Rachel. were names yeah. Rachel and Leah in fact it's funny because my daughter lived in Spain for a while and I guess there there's a little bit of anti-semitism uh, in Spain and her her doctor was a little bit anti-semitic uh, and so she has a little she has a son named Levi and and then she had a daughter and she named her Leah and not anything to do with biblical it wasn't a oh, biblical she just liked the names mm -hmm. I think Leah Michelle from uh uh, the uh, TV show. What was the TV show where they all the kids all sang? And she liked. That's where she got her name. So it wasn't biblical at all. But um, anyway, so Glee from Glee. Uh, Leah oh, Michelle. Oh yeah, hmm. that's what she named her Leah. So the doctor was like, um, "Are you Jewish?" And you know, my daughter was like, "No, you're mm. no." Yeah. So that was. But I mean, all of these mm. names. The other mm. thing that you talked about in the book was, and I didn't know this either because in the Mormon Church, Jennifer. Um, we were very, very uh, called on to read the Book of Mormon. The Bible was only as good as it had been translated correctly. You don't really need to read it, but you must read the Book of Mormon every day. So I had, like I said, I'd read the Old Testament once, and then every four years they'll go through and they'll study, but they they proof check it and pull a scripture here and pull exactly. a scripture here. Exactly. Yeah. the whole story. You don't really know the whole story. Right. So when um, our youngest son passed away, and mm -hmm. I really wanted Sorry. to thank the women that had been so supportive of me mm -hmm. when he was growing up and at the school and at church. And it was always the women that came through. And I really, so I was looking things up in the Bible about the women. And that's where I came upon the women that supported Jesus. I didn't know that story. And I mm -hmm. love it. Oh, sugar mamas. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that because I'm sure there's other people, especially you know, if there's any Mormons or ex-Mormons that are, are going to be watching this. I don't think they understood who, like these guys have all left their fishing jobs. They're not fishing anymore. They're walking around with Jesus all day. Right. Who's paying for their, who's exactly. getting the food? I mean, he wasn't bringing bread and fish all the time, right? Right. So talk a right. little bit about these women that, um, you know, that's basically supported the cause. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I'll read it because it's, it's very brief. It's yeah. the beginning of chapter eight of Luke. And yeah. it says, soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So I like to highlight this because, not just because of what you said about their, like, they may, you know, this gospel brought to you by all these women, right, who would yeah. save their money, right? Yeah, but it's brought to you by all the ladies. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But also, we can think of them as disciples. Yeah. And so there were female disciples as well. They just aren't talked about because it's a patriarchal society in a patriarchal setting. And so they're only talking about the men, but there were women who were also disciples. Right. And that for me was really fun to kind of shift the way I thought about all those stories and all those moments where Jesus is interacting with the disciples or for instance, the, the, the depiction of their last meal together I think there were women around the table as well and not just women there to make the food and be servants, you know, right. um, there were women around the table. There were women there and that makes things different for me at least. Yeah. Yeah. It totally, it totally does. And it makes so much sense because when you look <laughs> at the world and you look at organizations and um, <laughs> it does seem to be who's, who's in the kitchen, 
who's providing transportation, who's, you know, babysitting for each other so that they can get things done. Yeah. It's the women. And, and you talk about, I love, I mean, everything in this book is so amazing. Mm, Mary you. and Martha. And mm. I, I, in fact, I want to, I want to close today. Okay. okay. Cause I get, you know, and, and this was news to me and it wasn't news because honestly, I didn't think about it that much. But when I read that, you know, this whole seven demons from Mary and that Mary was a prostitute and, and I have, and I had a neighbor who is very, very good about her Bible study with the neighborhood that they all get together and do Bible study. And she said, well, you know, Mary was a prostitute. And I'm like, actually, Mary was not a prostitute, but you know, but I didn't have enough knowledge to back it all up. I just knew something about a Pope Gregory, I think it was, that decided that she was. And so let's talk a little bit about the Marys that are in the church mm -hmm. and what their role was and how they were, again, kind of put into the whole, we got to make her a little bad. <laughs> you know, can't be a hundred percent really great, a little bad, but then the guy came and and fixed everything. So we're good. Oh, for so goodness sakes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm fidgeting with my lighting because it just is, it looks really weird. Okay. That's better. Um, okay. So, so Mary Magdalene, the, so let me see if I can address why Pope Gregory or whoever it was. I think that's, that sounds right, but I don't know for sure. But, but anyway, one of the, one of the early guys made an intentional mix up so the verse I just read was from the beginning of chapter eight of Luke. The story immediately prior to is of is one of the examples of a woman anointing Jesus's feet, right? When he's eating, when he's out at a social event and people would recline, so their feet would be out from the table. So she could do that. She could cry, um, wet his feet with her tears, dry them with her hair. This is very sensual. And maybe even anoint them with some nard. Some So she had body oils or lotions on hand, right? Just have them in her purse. <clears throat> Just carrying them around in her purse, right? <laughs> well, right. I know. I just happen to have this nard. Right. My well, yeah. I mean, I had to have a, a sex worker point out to me, you know, like I, I heard a sex worker actually talking about passages in the Bible that talk about sex workers. And it was like, oh, duh. Like, of course, this woman is a sex worker. She's getting very intimate with somebody she doesn't know. And let's talk about what it looks like and how that plays out, that she's literally crying on his feet, wow. drying them with her hair. And yeah, she has expensive nard because it's it's important for her work, right? Yeah. I have a little lube. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or just body work, you know? Anyway, so, okay. Massage. Right. Yes. So the, the, the story immediately prior to our first hearing of Mary Magdalene is a story that involves, I believe, a sex worker, though she's not directly called that, but she's referred to a woman who's a sinner, blah, blah, blah. She's a sex worker. Okay. But the thing is, if, if the writer of Luke's gospel had thought that that sex worker in chapter seven was Mary, then they would have said it because right here in chapter eight, we know Mary, we know her name, right? right. So these are two separate women. There's nothing when it says here about Mary Magdalene, all it says is she's been cured of a bunch of infirmities. There's nothing about that that implies even in the first century that she was a sex worker. And then the the piece that sin, like pulls it together is that in Matthew or John, I can't, I can't keep the story straight, but I think it's John in John's version of Jesus having his feet anointed. It is one of the sisters, the Martha of the Martha Mary pair who are sisters. Yeah. It's the Mary of that couple of those siblings who anoints him in that gospel's tradition. So we have a general story about Jesus being anointed and it shows up and it's used in different ways and it's described with different women. And so you have a, a Mary who is involved in the anointing, but not Mary Magdalene. Right. And then we have Mary Magdalene on her own and important. And she's close to Jesus and she's Miss Moneybags and then a separate sex worker. And so you put those three pieces in together and you stir it and you get Mary Magdalene was a sex worker before she met Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that because it's like saying like I just got my husband. And I just got back from a little tour and there were. Uh, 20 something people. And I think out of those 20 people, I think 15 of the guys were called Mike. <laughs> and so, or no, it was John. There were like 15 Johns there. The other wow. three Mikes. 
And so, like you say, it's like just the name Mary is like that was very common. And 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 it reminds me of even the story, like you were saying, of of Mary and Martha, where they they, you know, they kind of I mean, to me, when I read that story, I remember thinking, yeah, I Martha's doing all this work. She's trying to get a meal on the table for everybody. And Mary's just like, tell me more, you know, <laughs> and she's like, get up, get up and help me. And yet people make Mary out to be the more beloved one because she was listening to Jesus. And I'm like, no, no, it's that gal in the back that's working her tail off to get food for everybody. How come she's like now damned? You know, it's like mm. the weirdest. I mean, everything I read, I was kind of like, I don't get this. And like you were talking about the, you know, the two sisters with Lot and and that whole thing. That was a little bit like, oh no, I'm not gonna buy that story either. So right. One after right. the other, it's like, nope, nope, and nope, you know. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. It's pretty, it's yeah, it is definitely a man's world, and they are stories written for men yeah. by men, right? Yeah. For their benefit. Right. Yeah. Women. I, I like what you said when you talked about, and I'm jumping all over the place here, That's but okay. when you talked about Bathsheba and, and David, right. And you just, and you, they make her out to be the bad person. <sighs> yeah. And, and, and again, using her sexuality to defame her, to, to make her less than, and nobody's going into the idea that this was not her idea. <laughs> exactly. You know, she had no way to say no. Yes. There's no way to say no to the king. He, yeah. s he sends someone to go get her. They bring her in. He taps that, sends her home. And she's prego. Like, they, she had no say in that. Right. Whatsoever. Yeah. And that is not even brought up. When you go and you listen to that chapter in Sunday school, nobody mm -hmm. says, and was that her idea? Or did mm -hmm. she agree? Yeah, right. Could you also kill my husband? Because that right. would make, it made this so much easier. No, yeah. That mm -hmm. wasn't her idea. Right. And and people acknowledge that this was bad, but they don't acknowledge her her in this badness. Yeah, it was her lack of consent, ability to consent. consent. Right. Her. Yeah. So, and and even to the point of saying she was trying to seduce him, as uh, if as if uh, bathing like cleansing herself after her period has anything to do with trying to seduce the king. Like what? Yeah. He is creepy for being a peeping tom. Is what it is. <laughs> It is not okay. And yeah. yeah. It yeah. all, I mean, in the end, it all boils down to what's being said today, especially with this new Christian nationalist movement, is that everything is like you guys, I don't know if you're familiar with the eld, uh, Pastor Leonard, I think his name was, that just gave, and this is an old guy, another, stop giving these old guys microphones. That lady <laughs> on TikTok, where she, I haven't seen her for a while. But please stop giving these guys microphones. <laughs> But he stands up and says, like, I went to the mall and I saw these girls in shorts. And I'm telling you right now, if anything happens to them, and I was one of the jurors, I'd I'd let that man go because that's her fault because she had on shorts. Yeah. And I'm just like, it's this, it's because it's they disgusting. read the Bible and they see all this, and it was Bathsheba's fault, and it was that's Mary's right. fault, that's and right. it was Ruth's fault, and it was right. everybody's fault. It was always the women's fault. That's right. Instead of and, teaching men to have any kind of self-control and respect for themselves right. and for people around them. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I am, like I said, I'm so thrilled that you took time out of your day to share this wisdom with me. And I really want all of you to, let me see if I can go back, uh, hold up your books again. Okay. Um, the, the, um, this is the one that you, that you read, which yes. I, I love because it's yes. actually, it covers more. And, and so I think it's a, this is a book that I wrote that came out of teaching a lot of intro courses to the two Testaments. And so it's kind of like, the most important and juicy conversations that were helpful for my for my students to really kind of help them reframe the way they think about what the Bible is. So permission granted, take the Bible into your own hands. Um, yeah. Really proud of that book. And then and in that oh, book, what I liked in that book, what I liked was you would just say, just read it mm -hmm. and think about it. Yeah. Think about it with a different perspective, with a different yeah. paradigm. Just think. Just That's think about all it. You asking people to do was just that's think right. about it. That's right. <laughs> you, you, you know, and they might go, I don't see any. Yeah. But then there would be also people that go, Oh my gosh. Right. I never thought about it like that. Exactly. Yeah. I never noticed that, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then my, this just came out last fall, actually. Um, 
So marriage in the Bible, what do the texts say? And just just so you know that what motivated me to write this book was the issue of same sex marriage and how and how even in spaces that are meant to be secular in legislative spaces in public spaces people are still referring to what the bible says and what god ordained yes. even though it's a public secular space and so I was in North Carolina in 2012 when they passed a state amendment to the Constitution that essentially defined marriage as between a man and a woman. And it just was like, okay, this has gone way too far. And so I've spent the last decade or so like working on that. Like, how do I help people understand what the Bible actually does say and doesn't say about marriage? And then you, we can decide if we really still want to uphold biblical ideas on marriage, right? Yeah. So can that's you, what- If they went and they used that route for the other laws, we have now decided the Arizona Supreme Court has now decided that stoning your son or your daughter is absolutely what? lawful. We've is now, this a joke? I, no. I, yes. it's a, I'm just saying they want to pinch. Oh, I was like, what? <laughs> well, no, but, the, but the reverting to the 160-year-old law on, on terminating on Yes, that's what I was say, but in Arizona, because I noticed your book on your bookshelf with the Ejaculate Responsibly. My favorite book. If yes. you ever get Gabrielle Blair on your show. I'm you working on it. I have yeah. a friend who knows her and he's trying to connect us. So I'm working okay. on it. Okay. If you connect, just let me know. Cause I'm just, I, I, same thing. I've I emailed know. her. Please Dang come girl. on. Please come on my okay. show. Yeah. But you know, she's, she's busy. She's busy for show. sure. Yeah. But, but I, with this new Arizona law that just got yeah. passed, you know, yeah. I just said to my husband, I said, you know, I never hear how this woman got pregnant. How did, who inseminated this woman? Right. Nobody ever says it's just about the abortion and killing the baby. And I said, if you want to put a law into effect, then you, there also has to be, and the man who exactly. created this unwanted pregnancy, exactly. something, fill in the Pre blank. Precisely. Yeah. So Precisely. that's a whole nother, a whole nother subject. But it is, it is, but it's, in a sense, it is related because when you think about women as property and as primarily on the planet to produce children, then you are not thinking about what they want for their own body and their own life when it comes to unwanted pregnancies. You are you are focused on the fetus first instead of seeing the woman as having value intrinsic to herself and not to her uterus. <laughs> Well, so I it mean, is biblical. It's a biblical, it, this, it, this mess, you know, around abortion rights is, bi it's biblically informed is the problem. Yeah. yeah. And so convenient. So convenient. I so. know. I know. Well, thank you again. And thank also you. that you're, um, you're on everything, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Yep. Um, I don't do Twitter anymore. Yeah. Or X. Yeah. But uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you go by the same at Moxie? Prof. Unfortunately, it's not quite consistent. Uh, the yeah, Moxie was taken on yeah, Moxie Prof. But if you go to my website, jennifergracebird.com, that has the links to all of my stuff, so that Perfect. can be an easy way to get to it all. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you'll find. Let me see if I can go back here. You'll also find. Um, uh, let me go to. Did I put the book? Nope. Because there was a link I connected. Oh yeah, it was on this one. Um, the, if you, if you buy, purchase the book through Jennifer, right? That's you can, jerk. you can purchase this one. Yeah. This one from me, but I don't have copies of marriage in the Bible to sell yet. Cause okay. it's still, it's still in hardback and it's just really oh, kind of expensive. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, and, and you said that one's going to come out in audio. Hopefully in about a month. I'm working okay. on the audio right now. It's perfect. I've, I've gotten so spoiled. I have two or three books that I just can't get through because I actually have to read them. They're not in audio form, yeah. but everything else I can go for a walk. I can get in my car yes, hiking. Right. I can do everything. And I'm like, I read three books this week, you know, yes, and, yes. They're all audio, and I love that. I do know? too. I do Plus, too. Your book uh, and Allie Henny, when I had her on, she also narrates her own book. And I love that because your personality comes out in the words and it's just, I just love it. So. Yeah. Well, again, I can't thank you enough. I really encourage everyone and tell everyone also your, um, is it short stories? What's your TikTok or your YouTube? Um, you do a little weekly. I, thing. I do. It's called story time is story what time. I call it. Yes. So it yeah. started out reading biblical passages related to sex and what we call marriage and physical violence involving intimate body parts. I don't like to say sexual assault yes. because sex yes. is good and assault is yeah. bad. 
Yeah. But yeah, it started out just as that. And then I kind of expanded it to any any of the passages from the Bible that I wanted to talk about. And then and now I've started writing, yeah, some people on to interview. So um, it's every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And it's when I go live, but you know, you can watch later as well. And excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I, I encourage everyone to do that. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank and you, I am anxious to listen to you on all of the other platforms. And <laughs> thank you. you know, and between you and Dan and Dan, it was hilarious. It was the, the funnest podcast. Wasn't that a fun episode? Yeah. yeah. And it was you. Just so, I just was so thrilled to have you on there. So, and even more thrilled to have you on my podcast. Thank so. you for inviting me. It really is. It really does mean a lot to me. Thank you. Well, thank you. And if you do any more, um, Will you be doing any like speaking publicly at a college or a university? Not at this point. I don't have anything like that lined up right now. Okay. But, you know, I will let people know if I am doing something like that. I would love to hear you live. So. Thank you. All right. Goodness. All thank right. you. Well, have a great weekend. Thank you. Me too. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. I told you. I know. If you don't believe me, I war I tried to warn you ahead of time. She's absolutely amazing, and you have to get permission granted. What I love about her book, again, is she'll go through the scriptures, she reads the scriptures, and then she gives you another way to think about them. She's not, she's not giving you doctrine that you have to believe. She's just saying, think about this. What do you think about this? When you read the scripture, let's look at it. Let's look at this scripture through Sarah's eyes or through Hagar's eyes or through Bathsheba's eyes. Now, when you read this, what do you think? And that's what it's just so beautiful. And of course, that's what women do. I love it. So thank you for joining me on She Became Visible. Please like, subscribe and share because I know it's an algorithm thing, people. I know it's annoying to hear, have people have to say that, but your commenting and your sharing and your liking gets this message out. And as I said, I would like more people to hear Jennifer Bird's, Dr. Jennifer Bird's words and her insight into the Bible. It's just, it's beautiful. So thank you again. And I look forward to talking to you next week on She Became Visible. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.